How are you? Mark PR. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be, be worse if it was Anna Smith PR. And I'd be like, you know. Anna Smith? Yeah, I don't know. I'm sure she's a nice lady. Oh my God, it's so good to see you. All right, everyone, we're going to be getting started. Everyone, go ahead and take a seat. Thank you so much. And welcome, Tanum. Should I go? As we get started. Tell me when I'm live. All right, so I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. This is the first conversation we've had for Perspectives. Um, on behalf of my co-chairs, Bernard and Warrington, who are currently getting cocktails, I want to thank everybody for being here with us. Um, does anybody know what Perspectives is? Okay, amazing, because we are a society, because I'm going to tell you, that really focuses on trying to have conversations. So we want, our aim is to make sure that we are um, uh, creating experiences where cultural um, diversity is kind of raised up so people can kind of feel like they're connected to everyone else. Um, our intention is for folks to be inspired, um, to be uh, educated, to find out new information, as well as to be engaged in conversation with people who may not have the same background, which is why we're calling perspective. So it's not just about one way to look at things. You can look at the same thing, but have a different experience. And so that's what it is. So like being a woman, I might have a different experience because I'm from New York and you might be from Hawaii or wherever. Um, we hope that by engaging these conversations that you will um, find ways to connect to people who were not like you and you, wa you walk away learning more than you did before. Um, so any idea is welcome. Everybody can have a conversation. If there are topics you want to talk about, let us know. Um, I know that we are just beginning, but I'm hoping that in a couple of, of programs, people will really understand that we want to set a different tone for the way in which conversations are engaged. So this evening, we are going to talk and have a conversation with Bryce and with Swathi. So I'll invite you up to the stage. Um, I will talk about them in two seconds because, of course, I have to embarrass them with my humble brag of all the amazing things that they do. Um, but just know that you can participate, you can listen. There are folks who are actually joining us um, live stream because we are still in the time of COVID and some folks actually still want to be a little bit more remote and we are looking to engage and enlighten and expand. Okay, so tonight we are going to talk about Polly Murray. Show of hands, how many people before tonight, before this invitation went out or before you watched the movie, did you know about Polly Murray? Okay. One, Adamika is always an overachiever. She knows everything. <laughs> um, but for our objectives today, there are three things we want to talk about. Number one, we want folks to understand who Polly Murray was. I can tell you that I didn't know who they were. Uh, I'm going to correct myself a lot because they were non-binary, and that's really important. Number two, um, our intention is for you to understand how Polly's legacy has impacted your life. You may say, oh, there's nothing, but if you're a woman, if you are a person of color or part of the global majority, this room right here, being a part of this club, if you're a human being, if you're a member of the LGBTQIA plus community, um, if you're a human being, there is some component, and you live in America specifically, there is something that Polly has done to kind of contribute to your life. Um, and we also want you to understand the impact of the, like, that legacy. And then lastly, we want you to make sure that you walk away thinking about one thing that will change you and the way in which you move in the world. Um, because I think it's really, really important. I watched, I was like, sharing with Bryce and Swathi earlier, I watched this with my husband uh, two nights ago, and he looked at me, he goes, I didn't know. And that's not how you play that game when you're like, oh, if I had a dinner party with 10 people, who would they be? Apparently, Pauly has now replaced Einstein at his table. And he's a scientist, so that's what that is. So with that being said, I'm going to ask you both, Bryce and Swathi, to introduce yourself, but I'm going to do the humble small thing, and I'm going to read so I don't get this wrong. So um, Brian Cracknell is a passionate storyteller and an award-winning social impact producer from North Carolina. He has led social impact campaigns for narrative and documentary features and television shows, including Just Mercy, which I hope you guys have seen, John Lewis, Good Trouble, When They See Us, 
Of course, my name is Polly Murray, which is amazing, um, and Flea. And Swathi Ryasam um, is, an is a science, science associate for the science and policy team at UCSF's program on reproductive health and environment. Swathi primarily works on using PRHEs, is, I say the acronym? PRE. PRE, <laughs> um, specific expertise to write public comments to regulatory agencies and support evidence-based chemicals policy. She also works to improve public and environmental health. This is your bio. I asked you to cut it. <laughs> <laughs> I did, but this is all the stuff that you do. I'm not gonna take it away from you. We're supposed to be recognizing and being seen, right? Um, through effective communication of complex scientific research and by empowering scientists, academics, and clinicians to use their expertise to affect change. The reason why I talk about all the scientific stuff because when you hear about Swathi's uh, um, activism, um, that's the stuff that's super cool. Um, and so with that being said, thank you so much, Bryce and Swathi, for joining me. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so my first question is, I would like you to tell the audience um, a little bit about your passion for Polly and the work that you do in the world. So that's how we're going to connect all that stuff I just said to why are you engaged with Polly. So who wants to go first? You want me first? Um, so Reverend Dr. Polly Murray um, is someone who I first learned about uh, when I was attending school um, at Duke University in Durham. Um, for anyone who's been in Durham, uh, you'll walk around the city and you'll see stunning murals of Polly through many stages of their life. Um, they're colorful, they're vibrant, and there are quotes next to these uh, murals of Polly about so many of the aspects of Polly's life and career that Polly was a part of. Um, Polly was a poet, a writer, a uh, legal thinker, uh, an activist, someone who has been a part of just about every single piece of 20th century history that we sort of take for granted here in the United States, um, whether it's gender equality and gender justice, racial equality and racial justice, and now uh, sexual and gender equality and justice as well. And so Polly was someone who was ahead of their time, and they knew that. And knowing that this person existed and sort of seeing back and looking for figures that um, represented pieces of myself that I didn't really get to see in history books before was really meaningful to me. Um, in addition to sort of seeing these murals, um, there was a time uh, during, I believe it was my sophomore or junior year on campus, where a statue of the Confederate uh, general and leader, Robert E. Lee, was defaced um, in the Duke University um, entryway. Uh, for some reason, Robert E. Lee was in the entryway uh, to the chapel of Duke University. Um, they removed him, and myself and many other students uh, protested and wanted to essentially replace uh, this now empty space in this entryway with Polly Murray. Uh, Polly grew up in Durham, North Carolina. I grew up in North Carolina. Um, and Polly has li lived in uh, doing it throughout her entire life. Um, Polly once applied to a job and during the federal government, and anyone who's worked for the federal government, you know that you have to do a full FBI background check. That means you had to send in every single address that she lived at. Um, Polly was in her 30 or 40s at the time, and Polly had lived in 40 some odd different addresses. But the place that she that Polly lived longest was in North Carolina, and so Polly returns to North Carolina. Um, joins the Episcopal Church and becomes the first woman identifying black priest in the Episcopal Church. And so Polly was the first in many ways. Polly was a trailblazer in many ways. And we're still learning more about Polly to this day. And getting to interact with the film and the documentary um, has been such a privilege and a pleasure um, because now I get to tell other people about Polly and you get to find pieces of yourself in Polly's story and legacy that you can take with you. And really just join the Church of Polly, uh, which is what the folks at the Polly Murray Center in Durham uh, pleasantly call it. So I'll stop there, but yeah. Swathi? I love that you brought up the Church of Polly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, in the side of my uh, paid works, I've been in California for about seven years, uh, but I'm originally from Durham, North Carolina, full city. Um, and I have, Sorry. yeah, please go ahead. I also have a loud teacher voice because my mom was a teacher. <laughs> yeah. 
now it's just going to be louder. Oh, oh my gosh. Um, yeah. So like I said, I've been out here for about seven years, but I grew up in Durham, North Carolina. Um, and I first heard about Polly Murray when I was a kid, like when I was 12. So I have a really long history and long tie to the legacy of Polly Murray and to the legacy of other change makers from the American South and from Durham, uh, specifically also Andre Leon Talley, RIP. Um, and other wonderful folks who really create a lot of the culture that we take advantage of today or that we like to call our own is specifically black folks from the South, black indigenous folks from the South. And so I, as like a third culture immigrant kid, uh, my parents immigrated from South Asia in 1987. Uh, got a chance to really be in the witness of that excellence for a lot of my childhood. Um, and I specifically actually, um, started learning about Polly Murray through interactions that I was having at Duke Center for Documentary Studies, which had a program for underprivileged youth in Durham, North Carolina, um, wherein I did like a photography program, but I also joined an audio documentary program that was producing radio stories for about six or seven years with the local radio station, going to Allied Media Conference, which is a really well-known progressive left uh, audio video space. Um, and I think the the reason that I am so passionate about Polly Murray and so passionate about, you know, the legacy that Polly really left behind is that Polly is an everyday person. And I think that that's the most important thing about Polly is that they are literally any anybody on the street that you could be talking to, that you could be passing by, could be a Polly Murray of your current day. And the thing that really makes Polly different than other folks is one, Obviously, Polly had a very, very astute sense of legacy and the importance of storytelling, which I would like to attest that they got from the American South and our love of storytelling mm -hmm. uh, and our importance of also cataloging oral histories. But also, too, is that, you know, they understood and were really grappling with their own struggles with identity, with gender, with sexuality and with belonging in real time and in an, in a, in an environment that could not even grasp the imagination that they had. And so I think the thing that makes me feel Polly is very special is that one, Polly's roots and my roots are very much the same from Durham. Two, that any one of us in this room and also myself included really could be and are of Polly's legacy in this understanding that we are change makers in our own lives and should be and can be outside of them. And then three, that like there is a really big importance to telling and sharing our stories and our experiences. So, yeah. So we'll talk about um, Polly as um, in her whole self, I mean, in their whole self, I keep correcting myself because I'm still- You can use either. Journey. Yeah, you huh? can use she, hers. No, I wanna, I wanna call them what they are. Um, there's this evolution of, so I remember in watching the documentary, every time they had a new career or every time there was a new hurdle, I would think, if I did one thing, I think my favorite is um, she didn't get, they didn't get into um, a university. So they decided to write a letter to the president and say, well, why not? And then copied the president's wife and said, well, just in case FDR didn't see this, can you see this? Very, very, very aggressive in a, in a positive way of not taking no for an answer. And if you think about the timing it was a time when a person of color, specifically a female in the eyes of um, the external world of color, did not have the right to even question the humanity of life, let alone pushing for something that was above what was considered their station in life. Would, would you agree mm -hmm. with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, do you want oh, to? I think something that, um, it's hard to think about, but Polly, had Polly not faced any sort of hurdles or barriers, um, we may know something other of Polly. Um, I think at the core, Polly wanted to be an artist. And had Polly got accepted into uh, UNC Chapel Hill, perhaps Polly could have been an artist and sort of pursued that. Uh, but instead, Polly was denied. Um, and Polly was a firebrand. And so no was not an acceptable answer. Yeah. Um, I relate to Polly in a way. <laughs> um, it, <laughs> we got an amen from the crowd. Um, but 
Polly sought to change every single room that Polly stepped into. Every single room that Polly entered, um, Polly was a disruptive force because of Polly's being, Polly's presence, Polly's thoughts, um, things that people would not even credit Polly for until decades later. Thurgood Marshall didn't credit Polly for the thinking that led to the critical decision around Brown v. Board of Education that allows us all to sit in this room today um, until much later. Polly thought of that, that separate cannot, like there's no equal in separateness and you can't have separate and equal. Um, she was laughed out of the room. No one took her Polly seriously in law school, but that was the decision that won the day. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg didn't credit Polly. Ruth Bader Ginsburg credited Polly briefly in the brief that uh, she argued before the Supreme Court, but didn't really talk about it publicly until decades later. Well, when I think about the, um, the Third Grid Marshall kind of um, reference, it actually gets more interesting. They were at Howard, the only female presenting to the external world of color. And for the first year, they weren't allowed to speak. Every time a question was, Paula would raise her hand, they would ignore her, them. And then after the grades came out, it was Polly, 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 Polly in year two, they were actually able to answer a question. Then to your point, Bryce, the document or the thesis or the theory that she presented, she was left out and then she made a bet to, who was the, who was the other um, professor? Yeah, and it's like, you know what? I'll bet you, what was 10 it, 10 bucks. 10 bucks that this is gonna happen. He's like, yeah, right, whatever. 10 years later, she's back on campus. And he said, uh, you know that theory you had? She goes, yeah. He goes, it worked. She goes, I know. And he gave her the 10 bucks. But on top of that, they graduated. And as a um, graduate of Howard from a law, if you were top of the class, what was supposed to be your right was supposed to be admission to Harvard for our postdoctoral studies. And I think the letter came back, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that based upon your application, you don't have the right sex or race for us to admit you. So they said, okay, and came to Berkeley, <laughs> which by the way, is not too shabby either. I think it was just sex. Yeah, <laughs> it was just sex. sex yeah, yeah, was yeah. it? Because okay. the Howard program was to admit Was it religion? Men. What's, what's the one? That was Brandeis, sorry. Yeah, that was Brandeis. Sorry, <laughs> you're good. It's just so much. Good. It's so much, sorry. Um, and so, but go ahead. Yeah, I was also gonna say that um, I, I really like the the classing of Polly as a firebrand. And I think that what is like, I wouldn't say like rare, but is rarely a story that we are told is the, I hate this term, so I'm just gonna say it and we're gonna move on from it. The resilience of black women. Oh, <laughs> um, so I don't sweet. like black women to be resilient because they are still human. Mm -hmm. And placing them as resilient gives them a level of like strength and removes humanity from the actual experience of struggle that they do face. and the reasons that they should be helped, not just like cheered on quietly from the sides while we all do nothing. Um, but I do think that Polly came from a legacy of black women and black womanhood that really stood right in its worth and its value. And we see that if y'all had a chance to look at the film, you see that in Aunt Pauline and the way Aunt Pauline and her legacy really influenced Polly and that really empowered Polly at a very young age, which is an important tangent, but still like the importance of child empowerment and like really allowing children to explore identity and explore themselves in a, in a meaningful way. That allowing Polly to think for themselves, allowing Polly to explore and learn is what gives Polly the understanding of worth and value that they're then able to go on and write a letter to the president mm -hmm. and protest the fact that they did not get into my alma mater, UNC Chapel Hill, mm -hmm. and, you know, determine that they have this value and they, they are reasonable. And, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, I think Polly was an incredibly patient person to sit by and watch all of these black men take ideas later that they had developed in law school and, you know, run with them and to watch Ruth Bader Ginsburg cite them and keep it a quiet citation for many years and then, you know, give credit later. But it was about Polly intrinsically knowing their worth through struggle. And I think that's really the most important part. And that's what makes Polly a firebrand is that legacy and that understanding. Well, there's a Rodin quote that says patient is, patience is actually action. So just because you're waiting doesn't mean you're not doing. 
Um, when we talk about record keeping and legacy, when you talk about everyday person, um, the film opens with this conversation from her niece who, be, who didn't realize that not only was she the executor of Polly's estate, but she didn't even know that Polly had done all these things. So she was related to them and didn't even realize what they had accomplished or what they had done until Ain't after that just time. brown people, though? Yeah, we just do. <laughs> we just do. <laughs> so there's a quote. There are lots of quotes that are attributed to Polly, but um, the one that stands out is, my whole personal history has been a struggle to meet standards of excellence in society, which has been dominated by the ideas that blacks were inherently inferior to whites and that women were inherently inferior to men. So there was this idea that there was never really a place. And I want to, once again, talk about the time here. We're talking about the South. We're talking about 19, 15, 20, Great Depression. Um, we're talking about um, uh, a family that probably didn't have a lot of resources, but then she was also a family that was mixed race, right? So I think she had, there were parts of her family who were extremely fair who and who passed but then those people were not accepted in either parts of society. So they also were isolated and targeted. And so there's a lot of external dynamic that was happening just around. So you guys, I, I, I know a little something, right? <laughs> He's looking at me. He's like, this you is. Got it. You got um, it. You got it. <laughs> and so there's a lot of, you know, kind of conflict. So with that being said, um, intersectionality mm. is this term. And I'll say this, that a lot of people like right now, it's like, oh, it's such a word. It's charged because we don't know where it came from or where it comes from or what it means. Bryce, can I ask you? comes from Kimberly Crenshaw, by the way. Well, well we know, because if you Googled it, you'll know where it came from. But Bryce, for the context of this conversation, um, are you able to give a definition that we can kind of anchor to so we can go into that? Because to me, out of all the facets of Polly, that's the one that kind of really resonates with me. Um, so... Yeah, essentially, um, and Swati, thank you. Dr. Lee, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw um, was the first person to sort of coined the term intersectionality, which refers to all the different facets uh, that make up a person's identity that we experience sort of society through. For some people, your identities may um, sort of empower you and you might be benefited from those identities, whereas other identities may oppress you. Um, Polly was also uh, one of the first folks to really coin our, this sort of idea and thinking into law uh, when Polly wrote uh, Jane Crow which of course is a play on the words of Jim Crow, which people refer to as the laws that were passed throughout the South and actually in the North and West as well um, that oppressed black folks. And so Polly was like, not only am I oppressed by my race, but also by my gender um, and how this shows up into law and the very distinct sort of intersection of those um, is important because Black women at the time and still to this day are that much further oppressed by society and by law and society. And it was important to sort of coin and to, to bring into our knowledge. And so intersectionality is sort of the latest sort of thinking of that in terms of how we're able to understand not only race and gender, but sexuality, class, region, where you sort of grew up, your religion, and any other sort of identities that one might possess um, that are either seen favorable or unfavorable and are treated as such. Um, by the rules that we as a society have put together. And for Polly specifically, it was the social identities that overlap for her. There was the race, there was gender, there was identity, and then there was a sexual orientation. So I believe that there was even a time when she says, I don't understand, they, I'm going to keep doing it till I get it right, don't understand. And I think went to the doctor and, and, and asked for a surgery to make sure that her Testes? Didn't have undescended testes. Yeah. That was a prevailing that I theory. Must, I, they're hormonally imbalanced. Like I have to be male because I, I don't feel that way. And they, of course, I think she was at Bellevue was as a New Yorker, like that. You don't want to go there. Um, but you know, she, there was all, there were all these, she was depressed and very, very, they were depressed and very, very sad and did not know how to cope and didn't have an outlet, but still found a way to kind of press on. And it was through writing and kind of poetry and kind of making sure they communicate. So the one quote that I have is, I cannot allow myself, that links to intersectionality, to be fragmented into a Negro at one time, woman at another, or worker at another. I must find a unifying press pr principle in all of these movements to which I can he adhere to. So what specifically um, 
do you believe, and I'm going to start with you, Bryce, and then Swathi, I'm going to go to you only because um, we've had this conversation before. What specifically do you, do you think, and how does intersectionality connect with this whole idea about systems of power? Um, and then share your thoughts a little bit on kind of Polly's lived experience and how it relates to this whole, because it's all connected um, for, for them specifically. Does yeah. that make, is that? Yeah. No, of course. I mean, I think the one of the easiest ways, of course, to understand systems of power, and these are things that we interact with every day. So um, for those who know physics, it's like gravity. It's just what you sort of are approached with. But instead, this is gravity that we created for ourselves and that we are sort of lived by as a, as a result. And so, um, of course, throughout history, the most powerful people create systems and structures that would benefit them and that were easiest for them. Um, sometimes intentionally, sometimes other unintentionally, but intention doesn't matter. It's what happens on the other side. And so what it created, of course, is that often um, the case of, let's talk about patriarchy, um, society for the longest time and still is, um, benefited, largely benefits cisgendered men. And what I mean by cis no. is that... <laughs> That's not true. Shocker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, with race, we know all too well about white supremacy. It rears its head every single day. Um, and for white supremacy, of course, society has benefited white people for the longest time. Um, with regards to sexual and gender uh, diversity as well and marginalized genders, um, thinking about folks who are non-binary, trans, who don't, aren't, don't identify as man or woman, um, of course, society typically does not allow for a whole person's self to sort of show up in these spaces. And so when we think about Polly's lived experience, sort of occupying different facets of these identities, of these marginalized identities in particular, showing up into these powerful rooms, very pointedly showing how these spaces are not suitable for Polly as a person, um, but also Polly then sort of saying, now I'm going to change it. Um, is very unique and very interesting. There's a interesting part of the film as well toward the beginning where during Polly's young life, let's say late uh, in her late teens, early twenties, um, Polly spent a lot of time on trains, um, riding trains across the country. That's when she was Pete and the, the dude. dude. Peter the yeah. dude, Pete. Yeah. yeah. She didn't Had like all wearing sorts dresses. Of nicknames. I think, yeah, she liked to yeah. wear pants. They like to wear pants. And I think it was Aunt Pauline who basically said, okay, we're gonna go to church every Friday, every Sunday. You have to wear a dress then. You can wear pants every other day of the week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is really respectable black women parenting in the American South. No, no, that's how it was. I mean, it's, and um, for the for the example of Polly, I think, so with regards to, the film talks about it a little bit, with regards to gender pronouns, I think what's important as well for folks to think about, it's often good to start a conversation, but Back then, there wasn't the vocabulary that we have now to understand the sort of wealth, the wealth and the sort of breadth of gender that we do today. We know it to be a, more of a spectrum today. And so had Polly had um, those that vocabulary, Polly may have described themselves as non-binary, trans, or even as a man at one point in their lives. And it was true that they would write to doctors um, and ask, um, basically saying, I, I obviously am in a woman's body, but I feel like a man. And Polly, these are very private notes. So the fact that we even know about this is because Polly wanted us to know about this after Polly's passing. Um, there's an entire wealth of sort of Polly's records in a library at Harvard University called the Schlesinger Library. And Polly's records are the most requested records at the library to this day um, because Polly was so intentional about keeping all of these sort of records about their life, these letters, um, including letters to lovers, and so these, we only know about Polly's gender because Polly wanted us to, but for those who knew Polly during po the course of Polly's life, um, her close friends probably thought that maybe she was just queer or lesbian. Um, Polly's uh, nieces um, still refer to Polly as Aunt Polly, um, still use she, her pronouns. And so we don't really know how Polly would have identified today. And so with regards to pronouns, she, her, they, them, really any pronouns using the Polly's name, Polly, are all pretty much acceptable. Um, but these things, of course, will continue to be debated um, for, as we get to know Polly that much more and as society, of course, changes. Um, but it's 
totally okay for us to go back and forth about what pronouns we use as um, poly. We don't really know how poly would identified. I also really like the idea because Polly Murray hated boundaries that like gender is fluid and so are pronouns. She, her, they, them, he, him, Polly, dude, Pete, <laughs> really, the whichever imp? one. Can, what what was have, the imp? Yeah. The imp? Oh, I think that was just another persona identity. Yeah. That was the, that was a, that was like a childhood nickname. Yeah. The imp. The more I think about this as being two of the things, female um, and of color, and living in the 20 and 2022, I can't imagine what it would have been like to have the six other layers of things that they would have to deal with in that time frame. And every time I talk about it, I'm more impressed with just the tenacity and the um, audacity to say, I'm not going to let that define me. I'm just going to keep going forward. And I think that no was the catapult every single time, because I, I think to your point, had they gotten yes, they might have stopped <laughs> and said, okay, I'm good. So these concepts of oppression, and I'm going to say some words because sometimes these are very triggering for people, oppression and, and white supremacy and inequity and justice, power dynamics. Uh, I would love, and as we have more conversations in respect to kind of perspectives, we're going to continue to talk about poly. These are things that we want to address because it's not anybody in this room that is doing the thing, but we all are living in a society where those things and the remnants and the impact of what was before still exists. And so the only way for us to move forward and heal is for us to kind of understand where we are, what it means and what it means to move forward. So I just want to say that because it's, it's, I think it's really important. And I've just lost my next question. Um, so with regards to um, human rights, I know Swathi, you're very, 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 very passionate about the human rights and the civil rights component of Polly's uh, um, impact on society. Um, how did she connect, do you believe she connected the two ideas of human rights and civil rights into the same body of work or methodology? Yeah, um, I think it actually leads really well from your last point mm -hmm. um, in that, you know, we are living in Polly was very much living in a much larger shadow, I would say, of like anti-blackness, white supremacy, Jim Crow and Jane Crow, as she understood it. Um, but, you know, we are definitely living within the legacy of human rights violations, genocide, enslavement um, to this day. And, you know, even when I think about how we fight against those legacies, we also have to understand how we actually enact them ourselves. So like, I will absolutely say, like, I've definitely been anti-Black in my life. I've absolutely also been colorist. I've definitely, I, we live in a racist society. I have definitely been racist because I live in this society and it's almost impossible not to be. Um, and those are all the deep complexities of our humanity that Polly was really trying to carve out a space for themselves in. And so when we're even thinking about these systems of oppression or thinking about uh, these myriad identities that Polly is really holding as a marginalized person, it is it kind of really all, again, goes back to that sense of belonging and civil rights within the context of human rights and, you know, even gender justice, sexuality, all, you know, uh, anti-imperialism, a lot of things that we organize around to this day, anti-fascism, are really trying to carve out a sense of belonging and to try to carve out a more liberated and safer and like just, you know, abolitious future for all of us, right, is to, is to create a space in which we truly feel like we can live our life to the fullest because what is holding many of us back really is having to navigate these systems of oppression, is having to navigate all of these obstacles that have been put in our way by legacy or are being currently put in our way by, you know, if we're talking about newer policies. And so definitely for me as a another thing that I didn't really talk about um, is that I am a current uh, third world left organizer in the Bay Area. I currently co-lead a leftist South Asian organization that's been around for about 20 years called the Alliance of South Asians Taking Action. And a lot of how we view and how Polly really viewed their uh, 
their identity and not just their identity as, you know, sexuality and gender, but their identity as a worker and as a professional was within this context of our duty to future and our duty to society and legacy. And so, you know, Polly even said that, you know, they were growing up in Durham experiencing this inequity among treatment between children who went to the black school when they went to school with Aunt Pauline and children who went to the white school up the street, right? And if you watch the documentary, you can see that white school has nice green laws, lawns, uh, brick buildings. I definitely drove by that school. That black school definitely looks like a repurposed slave quarter, like a shotgun house. It's just wood panel, wood stairs, unmaintained everything, you know, second rate everything. And when Polly again is making this argument about separate but equal not being anything that people can live with, what Polly is doing is coming from a place of reality and what they call whole person, mind, body, spirit organizing and saying, if you push forward the doctrine of separate but equal, it creates and validates this idea of separation as being okay, right? And it validates the experience that people are living wherein they drink from fountains that are, you know, not at, not equal to other folks. They're, they are allowed places. They are not allowed other places. They have safety here and not safety there. And by normalizing that, that fundamentally cannot create a future that really any of us want to live in in this room, if you think about it, right? And so, Myself, you know, Polly, so Polly goes into law first to try to solve this problem saying, okay, well, our legal understanding of equity is clearly messed up and I would like to solve this and I believe in myself to solve this with that, you know, firebrand again. And so they go into law to try to solve this first, right? And then after trying to solve it in law, trying to make do in law. But wait a minute, went into law and then couldn't find a job. And then couldn't find a job. Yeah. Because the world hates black women. So but then said, <laughs> I'll just stop my own law firm. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And th and that's the thing is like, you know, so Polly goes and tries to go into law, tries to start their own law firm, then tries to pass on and teach in Ghana for a couple of years, understands like free speech limitation and dictatorship, not just within the U.S. empire, right, or the U.S. context, but also as it's happening in Ghana with, you know, the uprising of a dictator over the 18 months that Polly is there. And then, you know, a lot further down the road after a lot of really a come to Jesus moment, frankly, for Polly, goes into divinity and really becomes the Reverend Dr. Polly Murray to organize mind, body, spirit, and self, really, because it is about Polly's humanity and about creating that future. And, you know, within that context as somebody who does organizing with, you know, my unpaid work as an organizer in grassroots movements here, but most importantly, my paid work and background in infectious disease and environmental justice and environmental health at uh, UCSF, really taking that acquired expertise that I've gotten, which is everything that I have expertise in that I paid for, really important, I paid for it, right? Not I inherently, you know, understand it, I lived it. Um, and taking that and giving it back. And that is the legacy of civil rights and human rights within Polly Murray's understanding of it and the legacy that I am trying to carry forward within that. So I want to make that connection now to where we are present day, because I, sometimes when we have these conversations, right, people, I think I mentioned the terms earlier that kind of push people back. Um, there's this gut reaction or this knee jerk reaction to, but I, I don't do that or I don't live there. Or, that's not my time or that's not me. The story that I think I talk about has been me, it's a personal story for me. So the past 18 months for me has been this evolution because, and, and if you just bear with me, on May the 25th to 2020, a little thing happened. And I remember I got all these text messages from friends of mine who didn't look like me. And I'm like, why are they texting me? Why am, why, I'm fine. I'm sitting in my house and I realize, oh, because I'm black. And because they see me in a way and through a lens that I don't see myself because I don't think that way. Um, my experience is I'm educated. I, you know, I travel. I mean, I live in France for Christ's sake, like literally. And so I had to go through this 18 months of kind of processing and then appreciating and then understanding that I am a direct reflection of what Polly and her legacy. And I, I, I know that now more in the past, like, six weeks because I've been really engaged in this. But when you think about it, so what I want to do is I want to make the connection. Why are you smiling? Because it's so sweet. 
Oh, it's true. Which part of it that I didn't realize I was All black? All of it. Oh my God. Because <laughs> I know I'm black and I know that I'm a woman, but the way that I live my life is, it's true. And by the way, authenticity, you have to be honest because I can't, I can't, I can't be a story if I, if I can't show realness and it's real. Oh, I know I'm black. Trust me. I'm on a mission now, which is why we are all here. Okay. So let's make the connection. So Polly, I want to talk about some of the things when I said that there are things in your life that literally every single day you are impacted by. Let's talk about some things. So we talked about um, the fact that brown little kids and girls can go to school with everybody else. That's, you know, so either you or somebody that, you know, did, did that. Um, from a woman's perspective, women have the ability to work, the ability to, I mean, own homes and property and, you know, not get married and not have kids if you don't want to and live alone. That is a, de a direct reflection of, of Pauli's legacy and contribution. What else? Marriage equality. Oh, yeah. Forget about that. Was that 20, 2020? 2015? No, yeah. So there you go. That faith based organizing. There you go. What else? By the way, that's just one person's legacy. <laughs> one of those things would be amazing. But I would also say, like, really, Polly, Paul, you know, even uh, being a founding web, uh, member of the National Organization for Women, right? So now oh, yeah. gender justice um, for doing the first. Uh, integration attempt, nonviolence integration attempt in DC on U Street. So yeah. directly responsible for desegregating U Street. Story? U Street is like yeah, yeah. black as I will get at. And literally that is the legacy of Polly Murray, right? So uh, they're at Howard, I think at this time, they walk into this restaurant. I don't remember the name of it, but at the time is a segregated restaurant in a majority black neighborhood it, off, you know, U Street is maybe folks Actually, who, I think it was the whole block was black except for this, this one, one restaurant. This one restaurant. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Won't they do it though? Um. <laughs> also, um, bus boycotts. Oh yeah, yeah bus boycotts. So twelve, Ten, which, which 15, 10, 12, 12, 15. twelve years, twelve years before Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. um, she and her friend Adeline were um, on a bus, and so they were coming from north to the south. And what happens is when you cross the line, you have to get up and get in the back of the bus. And they had no problem with it, but the seat was broken. So they said, "I want to in a broken seat," and they were arrested and put into jail. Um, where they couldn't sleep because they were bed bugs, right? And they were told, well, if you don't shut up, we're going to put you in the in the dungeon with the rats, only because they didn't want to sit on the broken seat. And then to your point, it was 15 years before the Woolworth counter that they, and they basically went in and said, well, we're just, if you're not going to feed us, we're just going to sit here and study. And then she brought more friends. More friends finally said, okay, fine, whatever, just go. And that's how she did it. But it was this, and it was peaceful. It wasn't this, you know, outrageous thing. It was just a very peaceful existence of making sure that that's right and that's wrong. Yeah, and when we talk about movement organizing, I think everyone believes that they need to be the activist on the front line. Um, I've been that person before. That's scary. It's a lot of work. You're putting your body, you're putting your life out in danger. Um, and my parents would find out a week later and they would chat at me about it. And it was I'm just finding out and I'm going to shout out you <laughs> after this program. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone has a role to play. And Polly was never that person on, the, on those front lines. Polly was someone who was in the, in behind the scenes, she was a strategist. Um, Polly was a theorist. Polly was a writer and an artist. Um, and so th there are different ways in which you can play a role in organizing, but everyone does have a role to play. Um, and Polly knew how to play that role well. And so there was even a time when Polly was a professor and the black power movement was really just taking hold and was reaching college campuses across the country. And Polly actually really struggled with that. Polly struggled with the idea after Polly had sort of supported and written the theory that sort of broke separate but equal. And now, um, and at the time, many black students are like, well, we want separate and because like this is all screwed up and we don't wanna participate in integrated society when integrated society really doesn't give Two, I can curse here, right? Yeah. Two shifts about us. Um, and so, um, and that was hard for Polly to wrestle with, right? And so Polly wasn't the person who was on the front lines, wasn't the activist, but Polly was still the firebrand. Polly would still put their life on the line just in different ways than what we're t uh, sometimes used to seeing. Um, and so that's just all a long way of saying that like movement organizing has many different players involved and you do need the person who is on the front lines. You do need the person who's a strategist. You need the allies who are also sometimes putting their bodies in the front lines because 
sometimes your white or white passing bodies are not going to be harmed to the extent that a black body will. Um, and so these are all just things that we should think about as we sort of move forward together in movements for justice and inherent injustice is looking back at history, understanding history. How did we get here in the first place? Um, knowing that we are here on stolen ground, stolen ground that was formerly indigenous is still indigenous, but we rarely recognize that, right? The only reason why the United States is able to sort of maintain the sort of claim to the physical land that it is, is because in the constitution, Native Americans are still considered as less than human. Otherwise there would have to be a reckoning that takes place to sort of renegotiate what that looks like. And when people are calling for land back, there are people who are actually calling for their land back. But when we see in uh, court cases in the last couple of years that folks have lived on Native American land for a long time and like tribes and not, are not <laughs> looking to like bulldoze homes or whatnot, but they are, there's a way and there's a reckoning that needs to take place and there are conversations that need to be had and we all have roles in those conversations and it starts with understanding history so we can move forward. I'm always, fascinated. I'm always fascinated. The past four census, I think, the Native American population has always been has been consistent at 0.7%. 0.7%. By the way, I'm really going on time. We're almost wrapping up. I, so just bear with us for a couple more minutes. We have, or we can keep talking if you like. Um, so you mentioned this idea of her being at the university. The thing that stands out is that she was going back to these young kids. They did, had no idea who she was had no idea that they had the right to speak up because of what she'd done. And the thing that they were upset about is that she kept calling them Negroes. She's like, they're like, well, we're black because it's black power. And she's like, they're like, who is this chocolate drop calling me a Negro, right? <laughs> so then it turns out there were like two boys that we were seeing in the documentary who would go to her house and she had all these books from floor to ceiling. And they said, have you read all the books? She's like, yeah, everything on the shelves I read, just not what's on the floor. And then they would go and they would listen. But I think my favorite quote is he would look at them with a, a cigarette half cocked and go, Negro, go learn something. <laughs> because it wasn't about telling them that they weren't smart. It wasn't about telling them that they didn't know. It was like, well, if you want to learn, go read a book and then do something about it. Did you have something that you wanted to add to that? No. No, I think that that was actually a really great summation. Yeah. I would also add just like, contextualizing the space in the room that we are in that part of movement organizing as well is like funding and financing our sustainable futures. And like, if you are not in an organizing space or you're not an organizer, but like you care deeply about those causes, unrestricted funding to the people who do know what they are doing, which is grassroots organizers, such as Polly Murray once was, um, or folks who are currently upholding Polly's legacy at the Polly Murray Center is the way to really move. And I think that that's a lot of places where also people get stuck is that they feel like they don't have the education to be able to keep up with X, Y, and whatever. It's like, you know, you can take your time for a political education for study. There's a lot of really great places. I'd love to plug uh, Center for Political Education in Oakland, an excellent progressive left spot where you can go and like get free political education. Um, but while you're doing that for yourself and for your own self-growth, if you would like to help people in the meantime, financing and funding is also a critical part of our movement. So being an organizer, being a strategist, being an ally who is able to be in direct action organizing and put your life on the line. And then another part, obviously, is to be a professional getting into the spaces that you have access to. Like I have access to spaces like at EPA or like within regulatory agencies or academic institutions. And now I have this politic and I'm in those spaces and that means something, right? So really understanding where your power lies and how you can use it to support communities who have the expertise and that who need to be heard would and be I, the only And then I have an easy one. Just ask questions. Say, I'm curious. I don't know. I would rather someone say, well, I don't understand. Can you help me? Than to make an assumption and then go. So um, in the past 18 months, there've been lots of moments where people are like, I don't know how to say the right thing. It's like, well, just start by saying, I don't know how to say, can you help me say the right thing? It's just easy because nobody, we don't, nobody knows this perfectly. I think I just told you the story that I spent lots of years of my life not engaging. And I'm just, I'm a baby in this. Um, and I should have been doing this since day one. So you're not alone in asking questions and not knowing what to do or what to say. So the easiest way is to say, how can I help? I don't know. Can you help me understand? And then once you know, then the onus is on you to see what you do with that. 
then that's when we start looking, not the first time. Did you have something you want to add? No, I mean, and I think in sort of asking, it's sort of, there's a humbleness to that. It's yeah. sort of also sort of revealing that you're uncomfortable um, and that um, it may not make sense now, but you want to learn. Um, if the answer is something that you also don't want to hear, that's probably good too. <laughs> um, if it were something you want to hear, then it would be too easy and then the society would be the just society that we all imagine it to be, but it's not. Um, so the answer you're probably going to hear is one that's going to be a cause of discomfort. Um, to sit with that, to be okay with that, and then to move in that, to get stuck in that, to sort of cry in that, to do whatever in that, that's just counterintuitive. Let it go. You'll be fine. If someone calls you out, let it go. You're going to be fine. Not personal. Show back up. It's not personal. The thing that I think we often get caught up in is that we often get caught up in individual actions. Indi actions of individuals that we say have harmed X, Y, and Z, have harmed this, that, and the other. We are all part of institutions. We're all part of systems and structures that we often have no control in. We do benefit from certain things. We do are harmed by other things. Knowing those things are important. Um, but also one's intentions are, in, are not necessarily important in that either. It's what, what sort of happens on how is it received? How, what's the, on, this, on the back end? That's what's important. And so when you move in these spaces and you move in this sort of work, understanding that you are one person in a larger system and that the choices that are presented to you, even if you make all the right decisions, may not always get you to the best outcome. However, we need to understand that in order to be able to move in it. Um, I hope that all makes sense. So it does. It's so great. I would also just say that like calling people out or the letters that Polly would write, those hot letters, calling somebody in or calling somebody out about like issues that they have done or the harms that they have potentially done, it's an act of love. So like really seeing it as an act of love and seeing accountability as an act of love instead of like a punishment, right? Because that keeps this like carceral, punitive system that we get caught up in that's tied to white supremacy in play. But like understanding that if somebody really cares about you enough to tell you what you're doing wrong or to tell you how you're hurting them, that they believe in your growth. Right? That's how Eleanor time. Roosevelt received it. And that is exactly how Eleanor Roosevelt received it. And there's a great book about their friendship. Look for it. I, so I'll, I'll, I, the last thing we'll, we'll close on, because I know that you've talked about the stuff that you're doing, Swathi, but I would like to kind of get a sense of kind of what is currently going on for you and what's next for you. But to your point about, you know, calling someone in, I love that. I won't give any names. There was a situation a couple um, weeks ago when I was in France and a friend of mine said something that was not a nice term. And I remember in the moment I uh, got very upset. And then I said, I need a moment so I can come back. And then when we went and had a conversation, I explained to him why what he said hurt my feelings. And he said, well, no, 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 not you, not you. And I said, it's actually not about me. It's about the person who looks like me or who is like me, who doesn't have the power, the confidence, the self agency to tell you that you've impacted them that way. And then that person will go away and it's with them for the day, for the hour, for the year, for the month. And then they're living with that. And so it's about you understanding that just because you don't know doesn't mean it doesn't impact. And so that's what we're, that's what I am talking about when it's like, because I want to see you in your full humanity, just like I want you to see me. And so I want you to understand how I'm experiencing the world when you have done something to and for me. So Bryce, you are doing some cool stuff right now and what you're doing next. Do you want to share a little bit and then we're going to wrap up our conversation with people? Sure, yeah, I'll keep um, much of this brief. Um, over the last year, in addition to working with this film, my name is Polly Murray, I've been working with a film called Flea. Um, if you all have been paying attention, yes, please see it. See it. it you can see it, it's on Hulu. See it. Um, it's on Hulu now, yeah, please check it out. Um, oh, you guys don't know who these guys are. <laughs> They're amazing. Um, it was, it's the first film to be nominated for Best Animated Picture, Best Documentary, and Best Foreign Film. It's been a privilege to work with this film, one of the most important documentaries I've seen in the last decade outside of My Name is Polly Murray. Um, please see that. It's on Flea. Excuse me. It's on, the film is called Flea. It's on Hulu. Um, I'm also um, working with a group of storytellers from across the country on issues of environmental justice. And we're essentially hoping to publish a digital magazine that will be something similar to the 1619 Project in a sort of scale and scope of our understanding around environmental justice. So all the themes that you've been hearing about today is added onto an environmental lens um, across 
the United States that is going to be so important and powerful to talk more about. And then I'm also a writer and a producer um, as well. And there are projects that I would love to share here, but hopefully a year from now, maybe I can talk a little bit more about those. Um, so anything else from you? Because yeah. I just want to know if there's anybody that once has a question or anybody? I have a question. Go for it. What's your so, name? My name is Brooke. Hi, Brooke. Hi, Hi Brooke. And uh, I watched you last night. And my, this, I mean, maybe I missed something. Okay. But I was just curious. She was running at Paul Weiss, which is a very well-known law firm. Mm -hmm. And if she studied law and she wanted to make a difference, why did, what, what was the impetus for her to go to Africa, especially Ghana? Like I, I, I missed that because, <laughs> you, like you know, she was a woman who finally got into a big ass law firm. She could have made and done some big ass shit there. But instead, she decided to go to Ghana. And don't get me wrong. I have been personally to West Africa twice. So I know what the, the attraction is. But what was her impetus to go there? I really think it is about what is your level of survival within this empire. Can you survive in the U.S. empire? And could Polly really have been, like for many years, right? Polly graduated top of their class, didn't get to go to Harvard because they were women identified at the time, right? Struggled, started their own law firm, was eating cheeseburgers and so many cheeseburgers that they got a tapeworm in and out of Bellevue Hospital and finally going to get this gig at Paul Weiss in a time of the new Africa movement in the time of black power. And she was also in her 50s. And was in her 50s. Yeah. So yeah. think about it. For 30 years, she tried like, to get a job. I'm so, tired now. Exactly. And I would say that like, it is about making change on your own terms. And Polly was not going to be able to make change on Paul Weiss's terms, was, were they? Right? They had to go and make change and attempt to make change and radicalize folks elsewhere. And, and it also really important to contextualize, right? Like, this is a radical anti-imperialist time as well, right? We have the Algerian revolution. We have like early bit, we have Iqbal Ahmed, right? Organizing in South Asia. We have the Black Panthers organizing an internationalist campaign coming back to Central Committee only in like the 70s, right? So Pauli Murray is a part of that send out as well and feels a calling to say like, okay, if if this is not doing it right, if Durham, North Carolina was going to discriminate against Polly, if New York, if if having Howard and Berkeley and Yale and all of this shit, right? Well, they didn't have Yale yet. But if having all of this capability was still not creating liberated futures or even secure like presence for Polly, right? If you're only just surviving, then why not attempt to go thrive elsewhere? There's another lens to that because think about this whole intersection of social of self. There's the race, there's the gender, there's the sexual sexual orientation. So there's all this confusion. Remember, she was also mixed race. So she had Irish, I think they were called the, the Fitzgeralds were her grandparents. And so going to Africa is also this self-discovery because what she did, she spent that time trying to understand the black part of herself. So it, she also used the time, they used the time to also do a little bit of self-exploration. Um, and help build an entire constitution. Yeah. Um, and then got put out. Because and helped dictator. staff the first <laughs> law school in, yeah, Accra, yeah. in Accra, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, so really creating, being able to be in and create the foundation of something instead of live within the system that you are given. Thank you for asking that because that's Great super question. important. Anybody else? Mr. Rhodes. Sorry. I like your glasses. <laughs> so I just want to make a comment and I just want to say thank you so much for putting this together. You know, I go to many events and one thing I always say is, you know, please don't tell me something I already know. Please tell me something I don't know. So thank you for this evening. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for that. All right. So with that being said, our objectives were, so um, did you learn something? I got at least one yes. Yes. Okay. Um, do you see how Polly's life and legacy potentially has influenced yours? I would say definitely. Well, not you. No, no, no. Everybody in the room. Everybody in the room. Everybody in the room. Um, and then did you walk away? And if you didn't, please come see us after this. Walk away with a, a potentially one idea with how you might move differently in the world based upon the conversation that we had tonight. I see some heads nodding. Okay. So call to action. If you haven't watched the movie, watch the movie. It's on Amazon Prime. If you have a subscription, you can watch it right now. If you do not, 
Uh, I don't know how much it costs, but it's nominal. I think every, it's like some money. I think everybody here, <laughs> I think everybody here probably has Prime because I have four packages on my front porch that are all Prime. So you have that. Um, what I forgot to mention is that there is a QR code around the room over there. And if you put your um, phone on that QR code, the discussion guide, which has a bunch of resources. So there are questions that you're going to walk away with. They're probably, oh God, 30, it's 38 pages. There's, Didn't you create that also? Yeah. Right. Shout right out here. to Bryce for Shout making a beautiful Bryce. discussion yes, guide. The discussion, also. There's, a, there's a discussion right. guide that has links, that has videos, that has articles, like all the things. Just click it and then take it home. Um, you'll do that. Um, choose one person in the next like two weeks to say, oh my God, do you know who Polly Murray is? Two people. Two, two okay. people. Okay. One for each of us. Three. Three we just people. up the number. Um, decide how you want to be an agent to support Polly's legacy. Okay. We have two more conversations like this. If you like this next Wednesday, got to do a plug. We are in conversation with Alicia Garza. Um, and it's a conversation called in uninterrupted, which is about, uh, what would the world be like? If global majority had not been interrupted and kind of what, you know, what contributions to society. So there's a theme because we are in Black Futures Month. Um, and then also on um, the 28th, we're doing another pr uh, program in conjunction with women of the battery uh, that are women um, building wealth. And so that is a program that is uh, affiliated with Kat Taylor um, and her um, initiative as well. And anything else from you guys? Go ahead if you want to. Um, visit the Polly Murray Center. Yes. Go to North also Carolina. donate the, to the Polly Murray Center. 100% yeah. donate to the Polly Murray Center if you want to maintain the legacy of Polly Murray. $1, $2, $5,000, $1, $1,000 is all the same. It's a National Historic Landmark. Um, there's less than 2% of National Historic Landmarks are dedicated to Black people, period. And even smaller percentage are dedicated to Black women. And an even smaller, smaller percentage are dedicated to Black uh, queer folks. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Please okay. donate yeah. to the Polymary Center. Yeah. And I would say also while you're visiting Durham, North Carolina, it's actually a particularly special place for like black historic sites. Also has some really great stuff going on at a historic site called Stagville, which is the historic site of the Lincoln and Myers tobacco factory uh, plantations and the Cameron plantation, which is a very wealthy white family in North Carolina and are one of the very few historic sites telling the actual legacy of enslavement in this country. So Go visit and donate to the Polly Murray, visit and donate to Stagville and like help create a future where we can have more than just this one Polly Murray. And if you like to eat, you won't be disappointed. No, no, food's great. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening and hopefully we'll see you next week. And if you remember the battery, please join Perspectives. All right, cool. We'll be here to answer questions. <laughs> thank you so much.